you know, it was eight years ago that I graduated with a master's in politics uh, from Queens. And it was three years ago that I finally figured out exactly what to do with that degree uh, by creating a, a very unusual company uh, called Mass LBP. Now, eight years ago, uh, it was very fashionable, and I think it remains fashionable, to talk about this political phenomena in Canada, not only in Canada, but across mature Western democracies that we refer to as the democratic deficit. Uh, at the time, Jeffrey Simpson, the columnist from the Globe and Mail, had put out his book called The Friendly Dictatorship about the concentration of power in Chrétien's PMO. Donald Savoie, that uh, you know, first-rate uh, professor of public administration in Canada, had published his book, Governing from the Centre. Uh, but the democratic deficit was held to be a phenomenon occurring because trust across the public towards public institutions was eroding, that voter turnout, of course, was declining, and that a power itself was growing more concentrated in our society. And the solutions, the solutions that political science was putting forward are solutions which have really monopolized political conversation in our country for well more than a generation. These are solutions that you know, that if we could only fix the electoral system, that if we could somehow rebalance the Senate, that if we could change behavior in Parliament, or if we could finally get Quebec into the constitutional fold, then somehow our democratic deficit would be erased, that confidence and trust and public participation would be restored. But I think we can all do this, this thought experiment in our head. Let's suppose I give you any of those things that you want. Let's suppose I give you all of those things tomorrow. Does that add up to a renewed fluorescence of civic activity in this country? Does it add up suddenly to 60, 70, 80 percent of people turning out to the polls? Does it add up to a renewed political class in our society? I don't think it can. And so I felt as much as we need technological innovation to drive our economy, as much as we recognize the importance of uh, social innovation, right, to drive our well-being, we really needed to get serious about democratic innovation. I created a social science startup. And we put two words together. We say it's a democracy company. And this doesn't sit so well with everyone, and I'll accept that. But like any company, you need a product. So what was our product going to be? Well, we manufacture something. We manufacture legitimacy. And that's what good democratic processes are meant to do. Elections manufacture legitimacy. In academe, we use peer review to manufacture legitimacy. We develop public processes. Very simply, we design strategies to engage citizens in policymaking that are regarded by the public at large and by political leaders as somehow more legitimate. Our name, Mass. Well, it comes from a wonderful quote from Tom, Thomas Paine. There's a massive sense lying in a dormant state which good government should quietly harness. Isn't that a beautiful invocation of a purpose of government? Not to tell you what the answers are, but to work to discern the resident intelligence within the public as a whole. So we're a private company, but with a public mission. And the public mission isn't to fix democracy. There's no heroism involved in what we're trying to do. Uh, we decided that we would focus on something very simple and much smaller than changing the Constitution or fixing the way the House of Commons might work. Because it struck all of us as very unusual that somehow in a society that is as sophisticated as ours, that is as ostensibly mature as ours, that we had trouble doing something very simple. Convening a meeting of strangers to solve a public problem. We set out to reinvent public consultation, simply because a lot of public consultation is useless, as some of our friends at NBC helped to make clear. They are the men and women on the front lines for improving their community. Every month, the Parks Department has a public forum, and they always send me. It's pretty cool. Whatever. I don't know. I don't care. But it's an honor. No one else wants to do it. You go to some sweaty rec center and get yelled at by the public. I hate the public. 
The public is stupid. From the people who bring you The Office, Amy Poehler in Parks and Recreation. Thank you so much for coming. What an amazing turnout. Thursday, April 9th on NBC. So when the dysfunction of such a basic aspect of our political system can become fodder for pop culture and we can all have a good laugh, this is actually a really useful thing because it means we can start talking about it and we can start dealing with it. You know, it's often said that in a democracy we're governed by the people. The difficulty is that it's not so much that we're governed by the people, it's that we're governed by our assumptions about the people. And increasingly, those assumptions are not only false, they're dangerous, and they're highly toxic. And a lot of these assumptions are reinforced by just poorly designed public consultation events. Let me give you a for instance, because we have this idea in our society that somehow a town hall meeting is like the paragon of democracy, right? Like when things go really bad, a public official says, okay, we're going to get everybody together. We're going to fill a space like this. We're going to put one microphone there. I'm going to sit at a table up here. I'm going to speak at you, right? You're going to have left your families, your workplace. You've made special time to come to talk about this issue. The only reason you're here is probably because you're upset, right? And so what happens? You get the sweaty rec center. You bring in two or 300 people. You talk at them. And then you say, time for questions. And people line up at a microphone. And I think many of us have probably had this deeply uncomfortable experience of watching what happens, right? Because people line up there, and they start getting upset. Because they're not used to speaking in public, for one. They know this is their only shot at being heard, too. So they have to convince that person who's literally sitting above them that they're causing real pain and maybe get a response that they understand. Well, I'd like to have a GP sitting next to one of these microphones sometimes with those clever brain probes or heart rate monitors, because I'm sure the adrenaline is pumping so much in people when they get to that microphone and they try and make themselves heard that they're probably clear out of their minds, right? They probably are crazy in that moment. And I think that's tremendously unfair, right, to put people in that position where in a democratic society, that's the shot you've got at making your voice heard. So town hall, I mean, this is an anachronism. This is, this is not synonymous with democracy. It's synonymous with an aneurysm, <laughs> right? And so very clever people are saying today that, well, let's do this online, right? Let's use Facebook. Let's create some sort of online discussion forum. And that's really lovely, right? It would be nice if it worked. But the idea of somehow the web now equaling democracy is about as likely as you getting any value out of the comments section of the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star, right? <laughs> There's some good reasons why. Well, the good reasons why it doesn't work. Because democracy isn't just the aggregate of individual interests. It's not just about us all having our say. It's actually about us working with strangers to try and solve common problems. And strangers meeting in cyberspace isn't a recipe for any kind of constructive solution, right? So we have, over the course of the past several generations, in this country and in many others, changed our fundamental appreciation for what the public is and what it's capable of. Because I don't blame a lot of politicians or public officials these days. If your only experience of the public is at a town hall meeting or when the phone rings and someone's angry, it's not irrational to view the public as something that is polarized, volatile, emotional, and ill-informed. Right? That's your experience of it. But if you go around believing that the public is something that's just polarized, volatile, emotional, and ill-informed... Risk management is all you've got, right? Because that's what you regard your exposure to the public as being. It's a risk. It's something to be managed, something to be contained. But like I said, I think this leads to a very toxic relationship. And, you know, think about the rhetoric that a lot of politicians use. They love families, right? They extol the virtue of families, and they defend communities, and they champion individuals. But while we're very comfortable telling the story about how much the public mistrusts politicians and public institutions, I think the real story 
I think the deeper story is the extent to which our public officials and politicians have come for understandable reasons to mistrust the public. It's a toxic relationship. But it's also a good problem. It's not a bad problem. This is a uniquely modern problem, right? It's a problem that exists because we are more literate, we're more mobile, we are more connected than at any point, right? And it means that well, it can feel like we're running 21st century on 18th century hardware, 21st century software on 18th century hardware. And 18th century hardware requires one thing from that public, deference. And that's the one thing that people don't feel. They don't need someone to speak for them. They want someone to speak with them. But the bandwidth problems that that creates for our conventional political systems, they can't possibly hope to keep up. We define this 18th century system by two principal ways of creating legitimacy. Voting and elections, right? Well, let's take a look at elections for a second here. Because elections don't create mandates. That's a political fiction. Heard of science fiction? Political fiction, right? Elections don't produce mandates. This is 100 potential votes. We recently went through municipal elections in this province. The average turnout across the province was about 36%, right? This is what gets you that mandate today. If you get 40% of the vote and only 36% of the public is voting, that translates into 14 out of 100 potential votes, right? So when we say that politicians have a mandate, that's not true. We're not electing winners. We're electing losers. Our winners are losers, right? Big time losers. And it's wonderful because then they try and blame the public. They say, well, maybe we need something like mandatory voting, right? So we're going to compel the public to go out and do its civic duty. How ridiculous. The losers are telling us to change the game so that they'll win. Why isn't it that we insist that unless all of the people running can't get themselves over the 50% mark, can't get 50% turnout, the election simply isn't valid? Now, that would create a very different incentive, wouldn't it, rather than just blaming the public? In any event, elections, they may not give you mandate, but they give you office. And this is a very powerful thing. I think the future of politics is one where we use office then to go out and create a mandate. Right? That we use the space between elections to try and build legitimacy, to try and create platforms. Elections give you office, but today, boy, they should sure give you a sense of humility. So, the problem isn't that we ask too much of people, right? It's that we ask too little. Or at least that we ask too much of the same thing. We want people's taxes, and we want their vote. But what else are we to ask of them? You know, it's really interesting. A lot of people have been talking about Obama and his first two years and what happened, right? Because it was extraordinary. You know, Obama's campaign didn't succeed just because of the Internet, just because of Facebook and Twitter and social media. It existed because he asked a lot of his supporters. He asked them to learn about the issues. He asked them to organize their communities. He asked them to hold meetings. Yes, he asked them to raise money as well. But there was something to do. And since his election, he's asked very little of Americans, right? He's barely asked them to drive less, to save more, to take a family in that's lost their home because the mortgage was foreclosed. He's failed to ask even what George Bush asked of Americans, which was simply to spend more money to keep the economy going. And I think this actually fuels a deep suspicion. If you needed us so much to get elected, and the magnitude of our problems once you're elected are so much greater than the challenge of just putting an African American into the presidency of the United States, if the magnitude of our problems are things like this economy that's fundamentally broken, if it is the effects of climate change starting to be felt, if it is the fact that inequality is growing and public health is eroding in America, then why should the American public just be asked to sit on the sidelines while government solves the problem? 
And I think the American public refuses to accept it. People want to say, but they're also willing to serve. And to understand politics in the 21st century, I think we need a new axis. Left and right doesn't fully describe the situation here. I think we're caught living between, as a public, two societies. What David Cameron in the UK has begun to call a big society. And what Anthony Giddens and Ulrich Beck have called the risk society. And these are two tensions pulling us apart. And conservatives and liberals or socialists and NDP, they'll want to pursue their programs and respond to our challenges in different ways. But I'd say they're characterized by two things. One, where we use professionals and we use regulation to try and manage risk, the things that we are afraid of hurting us. On the other hand, we want to be engaged. We want to be a part of creating value in our society, right? But so often it's the risk society that refutes the big society. It's the teacher who gets grieved by the union because he or she decides to wash their own chalkboards, right? It's the homeowner who gets tired of waiting for City Hall to fix the cement in front of their, their, on their sidewalk and goes out and does it themselves and gets a fine, right? It's the hospital which can give amazing clinical care to a grandmother but tells the granddaughter that you can't bring in grandma's favorite soup, right? These are all small, microscopic, seemingly insignificant. What does this have to do with politics, right? But it sends a very powerful message to every member of that public society that their productive contribution isn't valued, right? So if we're going to build back trust and confidence in public institutions, there actually has to be a productive role that that public can play, where they can take initiative, they can organize, that they can improvise around their everyday lives. I think the real question that I've come to eight years after leaving Queens isn't that, isn't about how we fix our democratic institutions. It isn't about whether we reform the Senate. It isn't about whether we make our MPs behave. The question that is in front of every politician today in Canada and elsewhere is simply, what is the public for? Thank you. Thank you.